Well, filmmakers Derek Greer and Ron King are joining us on Big Blend Radio's Happy Hour show today to talk about their incredible documentary, The Millionaire's Unit. It's about a privileged group of college students from Yale who formed a private air militia in preparation for America's entry into World War I. It is an incredible story, and uh, it is releasing out on VOD February 15th. 2018, tomorrow. So you got to go get it. Uh, go to millionairesunit.org. Um, we're really excited to have the filmmakers join us to tell this story. Welcome, Ron. How are you? I am very well. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, also, Derek, am I pronouncing your name correctly? I want to know if you're Scottish or not. <laughs> Derek, are you there? Yes. I'm sorry. I had the mute on. Yes, you're pronouncing my name Correctly, it's a Scottish spelling, and I'm, I'm about half Scottish, but way back. Right on. Are you wearing your kilt? And you know what they say about that. Now, just, you know it's happy hour here. Anything could happen. But, um, I'm sorry that I don't own one, but oh. no. <laughs> well, we have friends. <laughs> okay. We have friends for that. But uh, really a, a pleasure to have you both on the show. This, this documentary, this story, um, I, I had no idea about this, um, but Ron – Apparently, this is something very connected to you and your family. Yes, indeed. Um, it is a story about the very first United States naval aviators back in uh, 1916. Um, well, actually, the Navy Navy got a little started a little earlier than that, but this particular group of aviators. Uh, started in around 1916, and all of them who were part of this group, the Yale unit, were under Naval Aviator 100. My grandfather, who was actually one of these guys, was Naval Aviator number 73. So um, they were they were early Naval Aviators, and um, it so turned out that uh, our production group and team included uh, two other grandsons of these Yale wow. unit naval aviators as well so so yes uh i am definitely connected to the story and then also bruce dern is a narrator and um isn't he also have family that was part of this part of the unit yes uh bruce dern is the great grand nephew of one of the aviators who we actually feature in the movie uh a gentleman by the name of kenneth mcleish uh wow. who was an amazing um, wow. letter writer and pilot back in those days. And Bruce, um, when <laughs> Derek and I like to tell the story of when we were recording with Bruce in the studio, uh, he pulled out his phone at one point and said, Hey guys, I want to show you something. And, and he flipped through his phone and he found this image and he said, T check this out. And it was a photo of this, uh, old kind of mansion that's made of wood and it had four wooden turrets with windows up in the turrets and he said this is the house where Kenneth McLeish grew up as a boy and uh, you see that window right there that was his bedroom and I actually occupied that same bedroom when I was a child wow and we wow. said what <laughs> wow so that that was amazing that, that, uh, that, right after that, though, Bruce was blackballed by his family for being an actor and didn't talk to his mother for 11 years. <gasps> oh, are you are you <laughs> serious? True. I'm serious. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah. wow. He actually no got way. back in touch with the family from Kenneth McLeish's brother, who was the the poet um, poet laureate of the United States, Archibald McLeish, and oh. he had written a play that Elia Kazan directed. And Bruce was one of the actors under contract to Elia Kazan. So that, that was sort of his readmission back wow. into the family. This is such an – I mean, this this, amazing. this story runs so deep. And mm. to me, there's this amazing story of them being privileged. They, they had – I mean, it, this goes back to when you hear J.P. Morgan, some people run for the hills. But now it, when you start to hear about J.P. Morgan times, you know, yeah. this, is, this makes me feel good. And – you know, this, the way the, the documentary is put together, you become very attached to each of these oh, pilots yeah. and their stories. And I'm still getting goosebumps. And <laughs> No, no, I mean, it's, 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 it's moving. It is so moving. And the letters, mm. um, how you put this together is very Ken Burns to me because of the way he's done things. Like I've watched uh, Eleanor Roosevelt when he did that. And mm. then um, when he did um, the, the story of the uh, – 
what was going on with the Dust Bowl. There was these ways of doing mm-hmm. these photos and telling people stories and having, you know, the people on there talking. Just these reading these letters. Number one, can we go back to language school or something and start to learn how to, <laughs> to you know, write communicate and communicate again. like these gentlemen? I yeah, mean, it's, just, it's almost a lost art, isn't it? It is a lot. Um, it's getting worse. You know, Ken, I, I love history, and I've loved it all my life, and Ken Burns is really one of my, my filmmaking heroes. Mm-hmm. But we were uh, very lucky in the regard to the letters. Uh, you know, there, mm-hmm. are di- there are disadvantages to reaching back 100 years to tell a story. Uh, the film is not very good. It's mm-hmm. often not in very good shape. But... Um, Actually, they had just started with uh, very small Kodak cameras, and so they had little snapshots that weren't very good, but they were still taking photographs with large format cameras, and so the photography is very good. But we were fortunate in that almost all these guys were great letter writers, and because of Truby Davison and what happened to Truby, he was left behind as all but four of the others went over to Europe to fight, and they all wrote letters back to him. They still thought of him as their leader, and mm-hmm. so at the Sterling Library at Yale University, in the Truby Davison papers, there are boxes filed by each one of those aviators. And so you wow. can go through their letters, and when something traumatic happens, like the death of a comrade or a mm. particular movement during the war, you can look that date up and see how each one of them reacted to it. And then That's you can amazing. start putting the story together based on their reactions and where they were, and and what what big nugget of the story we're we're breaking off each time. This is incredible. It, it's amazing. And when you look at today, you would have uh, people's computers and a bunch of emojis. emojis. <laughs> yes. It doesn't. It just doesn't do it. I'm sorry. No, no. <laughs> you know, Ron, I, I want to go to you because also you know having this be part of your family. Um, did you get to talk to all these different families or, you know, was this communicate? Like, I feel like this is find your roots, you know, but this, I mean, we should merge these together because um, I think what's so fascinating about this is that there were so many firsts in this, you know, when you think about the bravery and this sense of duty, true patriotism, yeah. like incredible, like this mm. is an honor to do this. And if you, if you die in action, this was an honor. And um, there was this bravery, and um, it just, I mean, th- did you go through em- any kind of emotion putting this together oh. and being connected and, and, you know, getting to know their stories and, and, you know, even the families, like even Bruce Dern? Right. Um, I definitely went through uh, lots of emotion, particularly reading my grandfather's letters from 1916 mm-hmm. to 1919. Uh, my aunt had a collection of about 200 of these letters. Okay. And um, they, um, Mark Wartman, who wrote the, the Millionaire's Unit book, which we were inspired by, didn't have access to these letters of my grandfather's when he was writing the book. So it was all new information for myself and for Derek as we were working on the documentary. And, um, you know, as you say, they they would describe everything in those letters. So it mm. it was really amazing to to read them and to, you know, feel firsthand like you were there while mm. all these things were going on. But I will say also that you were talking about um, you know, generations and, and how descendants responded to this. What we found out in the course of the seven years of making the film was that um many of these families cherish the stories of their relatives back then. Mm. And it turned out that uh, the project and the process of making the film, we actually, in a way, drew together the families who hadn't been closely associated for, for, two gen- you know, for generations. Wow. Uh, and, and uh, you know, we had people from other families who were part of the filmmaking team, but then we also got access to archives from several of the other families and their, their photos and letters and diaries um, and ephemera from the period, which added a very uh, richness to the film that, uh, you know, we couldn't have gotten any other way. And, yes, there was a pride. There was a pride amongst everyone for their relative service and, and what they had been through. So um, it was very emotional for that, that reason, mm. every, everybody coming together after two generations, you know. 
And I also looking. Bit, and go ahead. I was a bit envious um, of, of Ron for having that personal connection, which I didn't mm. have. But we spent so much time with these guys that uh, it was really quite amazing um, that uh, um, I, I would sit there and. Um, uh, Sorry, uh, someone came to my front door. Um, pouring over these photographs and these letters of these guys, um, it w I, I would think, you know, what would they think 100 years back that 100 years mm -hmm. later these guys would study and analyze their lives so closely? And we right. got to know them yeah. so well just from looking at their pictures and reading what they wrote. And then uh, I went to Europe and I filmed some of their graves. And all of a sudden to be standing over the remains mm. of Kenny McLeish uh, wow. was incredibly moving. It was, it was really powerful. It, it's interesting to me because when, when you hear the word millionaire today, um, this kind of dedication to fighting for our country doesn't necessarily come to mind. Mm. In fact, I, I think it's more of a, a, probably more of a, a negative than I, you just wouldn't think that you would. It, I'm just amazed at young men who are privileged who had the dedication that they did. Because I, I don't. Would that happen today? I wonder. Yeah. Well, so many things have changed about our country and our society. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, you know, and Vietnam really, really destroyed a lot of that culture. I mean, that's mm -hmm. when the ROTC was kicked off the Yale campus in 1972. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that really was rather damaging. Uh, these guys were rather selfish, uh, mm -hmm. selfless, and they were mm -hmm. prescient about what mm -hmm. was going on. But also, since they really were wealthy, and the world was really their oyster. They could have done anything. And yeah. ex exploration had already happened. The frontier of the United States had closed. People had crossed oceans. They had been to the poles. But the, the real new thing that excited them uh, and that they could afford to do was aviation. And not right. just anybody could get into aviation back then. You, you know, you had to have mm. access to a plane and some money. And so, you know, a lot of it was was the idea of adventure and and also the build-up to world war one was so momentous nothing like that had ever happened and so a lot of them just said i have to take part in this this is the mm -hmm. this is the biggest thing in the history of the world and i mm -hmm. want to see it and they didn't get to do it immediately i mean this was a build-up because you've got to think you know airplanes being used in war this was like a new thing for our country you know and this and mm -hmm. when you look at these planes versus what we have now we have fighter jets and you're looking at submarines, we, we had this opportunity that just is still today just is, is amazing to me. Um, it was you know, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis. We interviewed the gentlemen, the, the, the Navy, and the, that were there that actually were the ones who pulled the plug when JFK called and said, that's it, we're done, we're not going to blow each other up. And they were the ones wow. talking to, mm -hmm. yeah, um, Gary Slaughter Gary is his Slaughter, name, yeah. and the PBS mm -hmm. did a, mm -hmm. a, a documentary on it, and um, I think BBC was trying to do one. And, and so, anyway, we had him on a show talking about it. He's since written his stories, but um, we actually, I mean, who was left alive today came on our show. And watching your documentary brought it home it for was, me yeah. because of the submarines, which was still very hard to understand what these submarines were doing and when they spoke and this was that point everything was okay we've got the call to stop it all right there and there was the russian on on the other side and and him and it was gary our friend gary and he turned and said okay well what can we we're, we're not going to do anything um what can we do and he's like oh we want bread and cigarettes and coffee and, right. it was. and <laughs> he was about to give it to them and then photographers <laughs> Went flying over and to to actually photograph this, and I was thinking of you both when we were watching this. To photograph this moment, had to throw flares to capture it because it was at night at sea. And when they wow. did that, the whole thing, everything almost went the opposite direction. Right there during peace, they thought they're being attacked. They, were, they uh. thought they were, everybody looked up, and there was that split second. And then everyone was like, mm. "Okay, no." I mean, it was that split second mm. that this. Crisis could have really blown up, and we wouldn't be here. You know? So it's um, just that that whole thing about how you know 
at that point, mm-hmm. we had airplanes doing that. And I was thinking about that and how these guys, you know, World War I, having to learn how to fly these kinds of planes. And, th- I mean, it took them a while. And Marianne, mm-hmm. <laughs> and seaplanes, and then mm-hmm. going and learning, and then all of a sudden you're in combat, and then this bravery and this, like, I'm going to get you, the revenge, the eye for an eye mode. It just is really that, I, it's, it's amazing to me, that, that kind of, I'm sorry, cojones. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that. yeah. They you know? they really had it. They 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 talk about that in their letters. What it took to fly, you mm-hmm. know, and they they really had to push the United States Navy. Um, the Navy mm-hmm. was thinking that yeah, it's great to have observation planes, but I'm not going to give up my battleship to put a huge ramp on top of it so that this little flimsy plane can fly off and on it. And uh, so it really took them pushing, and it, and it really took the vision of Truby and, and Robert Lovett and a, a few of their others, um, you know, to get ready so that actually when we belatedly did go to war, the Navy turned around and these were about the only guys that were ready. And it was only a matter of months, but uh, naval aviation were the first Americans in Europe um, uh, joining the war, and Robert Lovett mm-hmm. was the first one who flew a combat mission. And then Dave Engels was the Navy's only ace. And Al Sturdivant was the first naval aviator to die in combat. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, there were, there were a lot of firsts. Yeah. But, but uh, you bring up aviation, and uh, Ron and I really realized how important it was for the audience to understand what it took mm-hmm. to fly these planes. We didn't mm-hmm. want to just show old archival black-and-white footage of planes up in the sky without any understanding of what it took Mm -hmm. to fly them. And we came to this realization because we found out that there was a collector in California who had several dozen planes, all with original engines, 100-year-old engines, that flew. And he invited us to his annual fly-in, and we got to see these planes up close. And they were so beautiful. And so simple and yet sophisticated. And we thought, well, if we can film these close up uh, and hear their original engines, because they're completely different from, Mm. almost completely different from anything that flies today, that the audience could really get enraptured uh, with Mm -hmm. the idea of what these young guys were doing. I I love that part. How did you, how did you actually film that? Did you have drones to, because when we were watching it, it was like it was so interesting to be able to see what they could feel like. Because I always wondered where were the guns? I mean, like, how did that happen? How did that all work? And to be able to, like you're saying, be able to see that. How did you film that? I mean, did you use drones or did you uh, we get did in not plane? use drones? Um, we did it mm-hmm. long enough ago that it was almost sort of pre-drone. Uh, we did use GoPros though a lot, wow. which were very helpful. But in the end, I mean, what we really did. Uh, in New Zealand, as we got up in the air with helicopter, with a helicopter, and with a Cessna, and we shot air to air, flying right along those planes, wow. and um, and, that, and that's really where we got the the best the best photography. In the connection is amazing. What you were able to do mm-hmm. because I feel like I know these men exactly. You know, and you, I wonder um, if you had used actors if. If it would have been the same, you know, I don't know. Somehow it just seems yeah. totally more real. Ron, because of this being, you know, part of your lineage and also, you know, everybody else working on the film that also was connected, you know, by family. Right. Was there like a sense of true integrity, like where you go, this isn't, this this can't be, like, I'm not saying acting right. fake. I don't want to say that, but you know what I mean? No, absolutely. I mean, there's two two points on that. One is Derek and I were very, very interested in trying to give the audience uh, a, you know, first person view of of what these experiences were like. And mm. th- the best way to do that was to use their own words. <laughs> and so that's why we use the letters and the diaries. And that, you know, that really really uh brought that out and um yeah i mean that was that was quite powerful uh to mm. to do to do it that way to, to to sort of establish almost an intimacy with uh the voices of these these young guys and as mm-hmm. far as actors go we did employ voice actors or actually mm-hmm. real actors uh mm-hmm. to read some of the letters but we 
definitely stayed away from the notion of doing actor reenactments mm-hmm. of scenes or anything like that. Uh, Derek is, has a very strong opinion about that, um, which I'll let him express, but I also feel that that would have kind of thrown our audience actually out of the story instead of, hmm. you know, sticking as closely as we could to the authentic words and emotions of the guys who actually experienced it. Hmm. So that, that was our choice. We had a, we had a hand actor. <laughs> we, we filmed a couple of hands writing letters, uh, but we didn't really have uh, faces and people talking. Uh, and, you know, we suggested some of our characters with the pilots in the airplanes, but, um, we didn't really have actors impersonating the characters, per se. So you really do have hand actors. Remember in Seinfeld with George, George yeah. Costanza when he became a hand actor? A hand model. A hand model. Okay, yeah. there you go. I forgot. <laughs> it was George Costanza in there, um, everybody. But he really wanted to be right. an architect. <laughs> you know, all while we were working uh, on this documentary, Ron and I kept saying, you know, this would make an amazing narrative feature or an amazing mm. miniseries because the arc oh, of the yeah. historical story – is is really pretty perfect mm. you know there's there's tragedy at the end and yet uh, a sense of victory and accomplishment all of the characters are different you you have the hard driving intellectual you have the big mm. muscle man football player you know who's very dynamic you have the sensitive guy who's trying to convince his girlfriend to marry him from overseas and yeah. i mean the characters are just they're they're perfect but mm-hmm. um as Ron said, uh, for me, watching reenactors always takes me out of the story. And I wanted mm-hmm. to see how strong a sense of these guys we could give just from photographs, just from sounds, and just from a, a ephemera. See, actual seeing their handwriting on the page as we mm-hmm. hear their words and look yeah. at their pictures. You know, how can we bring that alive? And again, with documentaries, the, the veracity, the idea that this story is true. It, and it's exceptional and thrilling and dramatic and romantic, and yet it's true. I, you know, and I love it it's because you, you brought history to life, and it's so mm-hmm. hard to sell history sometimes. Yet these true stories, they're the best, you know, and, and, and you really proved it with this. And, you know, when you, oh, you do you. a lot of travel, and part of our thing with Ken Burns is, you know, we have a, a Heather magazine, Parks and Travel magazine, because we – are addicted to national park units, all of them. The, the two-thirds of them are historical. And I, like, watching this, now I'm, like, in this crazy, like, and you both have to get like me at some point. I know you do. But you suddenly become obsessed with different characters and you want to find everything out about them. You know, you, mm-hmm. we go to museums and, and, you know, historic sites all the time, and you'll find somebody's story that you've never heard of, and yet they've done something amazing that you just like, wow, how did they do this? And then you yeah. want to find everything. And then you want to go to their graves. And then you want to go here. And you want to go everywhere they've been. Yeah. And um, it, you just become like, wow. And now watching this, now I want to go to wherever these guys, you know, we were just, I was writing mm-hmm. this thing on, on back east. And so today watching this, I'm like, dude, that's where they were. I was just writing about this, you know. <laughs> it's like, oh, this is putting it there. And, and to see, like, you know, the his, historical side of it, too, is amazing. But there's um, a, a, one of our experts is Glenn Burroughs. He takes um, people on tours through England that connect to their family history. Ooh, and how great. this is this mm. is what really got me today too. And now I'm like, okay, now I want to do a whole other segment on this because yeah. <laughs> Glenn, he, I mean, he connects people's history, and he says a whole bunch of people go over there, and he's written articles about it for us too on um, people going on over there for aviation history because of America's America using England off the coast of Norfolk and East Anglia as a place to go for fighting World War II that America we can yeah. yeah we had airfields air bases, air and air bases. bases and people go he'll find people with farmers where a plane went down and the family goes to where the plane went down I mean it's it's amazing and so watching this I'm like this is all part of it and that I mean I don't he did World War Two but now I have to call him and ask him to do World War One right because now yeah. I want to take everyone's names yeah. and go like can you go look 
He said, because there, people got engaged, it was written down somewhere. If they got married, it was written down. So now I want all the names of all the pilots. <laughs> I want to send it to him and say, go look, Glenn, because it is, it's amazing. So did you get obsessed? Did each of you, like, I want to know, like, did you have specific things? You know, let's start with you, Ron. Did you get obsessed and decide I'm going to go look for everything about this person in different places around the, around the world because they, they went everywhere? In Europe. Yes, I mean that sense of being uh, obsessed was definitely part of my experience making the movie. It was um, particularly in the early early years, <laughs> early years of the seven years. Uh, mm. I was just fascinated with where are the artifacts? You know, where mm. are the photos? Where are <laughs> where are these uh, any sort of vestige or uh, anything that's left over from the from that period, you know, where is it? I'd love to see it. And, you know, it, it's lucky that through the course of making the film, we actually got to, to see and, and touch things and find things that, that were part of their story that, you know, at the beginning of the process, we didn't know anything about. I remember one of the things that turned up during the course of making the film was Truby Davison's diary mm. that uh, we didn't know about. And suddenly one of wow. our connections, one of our family members had had a copy of it and was like, Oh my gosh. Wow. And then we, we, we got a you know, we got copies of that. Um later on I went to the uh the the Ohio Historical Society in Columbus where my grandfather's papers are and I I didn't know what was there. I wanted to find out more. So I ordered all the boxes to be brought down. They opened it up, and there inside one of the boxes was, were my grandfather's goggles from World War I. Oh, wow. Uh, I mean, I was like, You're giving wow. me goosebumps. You guys, stop it. <laughs> A story wow. I like to tell is that uh, Truby Davison had done an oral history, I think, in the 50s. It was at Columbia University, and we were fairly far along with the script, and Ron wanted to get it, and I didn't think it was going to be very important, but he went ahead and got it. And mm -hmm. the early part of it talked about uh, him and his brother uh, when they were 15 and 17 going up into Alaska, that their dad had sent them up there with some mining engineer of some mine that he owned. And that's when they found out about the beginning of World War I, when yeah. they were in the backcountry. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, that's a pretty good way to open the film. And I started yeah. looking for archival yeah. stuff from Alaska 100 years ago, and a couple months later – on one of our fundraising conference calls, Harry Davidson says, you'll never believe what I found in the attic last night. He found a photograph album of their trip to Alaska. And wow. he said, I would not have known what this was without this oral history, where Truby just kind of mentions it offhand that Ron had gotten. So it was a lovely coming wow. together of all of our, all of our actions. I, but I, I've, I've been I obsessed did. with World War One for 10 years now, and I have several hundred books literally on World War One, and uh, we're in the centennial now. Yeah. And because of the centennial, but also because of Mark's book, which came out in 2006, and because of our film, uh, the French have gotten in touch with us. And Mushik, uh, one of the air bases where they flew from, they built a new memorial there to the American pilots. And oh. a couple a month or two ago, I got a letter from a man in Belgium, and he said, can you help me? I want to put up a wow. marker at the farm where Kenny McLeish was found when wow. he was killed. Wow. And uh, yeah. so I sent him some copies of our film to give to the local mayor and to tell the story, and the farmer has agreed to have it on his property. And uh -huh. so all of these things are, are popping up. Oh, well, we got to call Glenn. I'm does, telling you, we got to yeah, do we got to do, do a World War One thing. There's going to be more to this, but it's amazing. I was saying to Lisa, you know, you you hear a lot about Vietnam War, and you hear a lot about um, probably because Mash about you know Korea, and you hear World War Two, but rarely do you hear anything about World War One. Mm -hmm. And you know? I I don't think that um, I also think it's hard to get that kind of history because sometimes. When people come home from war, they don't really talk so much. And so you do right. need the letters that they were writing, you know, um, and that's such treasured things that you were able yeah. to get that. Is there a museum? I, to me, there should be a national park dedicated to them. I'm sorry. Like, can we go where, you know, the Marianne was, the seaplane, and put a park up there <laughs> for them? Well, there, there are several uh, good reasons why we never hear about World War I. And we, we got there rather late. 
Mm -hmm. But journalists were not allowed on the Western Front. And so uh, they made up a lot of stuff about what happened for the newspapers back home. And it was very hard for Americans to understand what was going on. But then when they did get over there, they took part in the huge Mouz-Argonne battle uh, in September, October, and into November, I think. uh, No, not quite November of 1918. And, And it was just a brutal, brutal slog of a battle. There was nothing dramatic about it. There was no Chancellorsville where, you know, one army snuck around behind the other. There was no Gettysburg. There was no charge up Bunker Hill. It was just fighting Mm -hmm. against these entrenched Germans in three walls that were named for the witches in in Richard Wagner's uh, uh, Ride of the Valkyrie, or um, uh, Siegfried, his opera, uh, mm-hmm. and um, huh. it, it, it was it was really a horrible experience. And yet, the war was so important, uh, so important to us as a nation. I mean, it really destroyed Europe. But even though World War II was five times bigger, World War One wiped out four empires, changed mm. the map of Europe, and so um, destroyed all of those countries that it allowed. Um, America to step into the vacancy onto the world stage and become the superpower of the 20th century. And that, that would not have happened had Europe not destroyed itself. You wow. know, the Industrial Revolution had come to us late, and uh, we still had a ton of resources, and, and Europe knew that and badly needed them. Um, but wow. it, it's really the war that made America, you know, what she was for the last 100 years. It's interesting because when we, we lived in England, it was in the early 80s. We just left Kenya. We were living there, and then we moved to England. And everywhere we went, they kept going, you were late for the war. They didn't say it that way. They, you were well, late for the war. Yeah, and it really. Was, <laughs> everywhere we I, went. I, I, and I, I didn't know what they were talking about. I, was I a thought kid. they were talking about Vietnam. And, mm-hmm. I, and I was like, I'm not sure we should have been there. I know. So it was a very <laughs> – oh, I know. So it was a very interesting <laughs> thing. But, um, you know, the other part of it, too, is watching these – young men, I mean, you're in college and, you know, they were doing theater and they were doing the arts and they, they were in the, the, the secret societies that, and getting the tap on the shoulder, that's a trip. Yeah. Because um, I always wondered about that yeah. because they yeah. say half the presidents are a part of that and then people say that that gets into this whole other crazy land of, of things. But um, don't come after me now for saying that. But <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I know, I'm like, what did I just say? Uh, but um, watching them become men through here like watching through their writings and and through the story their stories that you're telling watching them become men and thinking and um levitt levitt i would say i was going to say john levitt because of the comedian i'm like are you related um but watching (laughs) him become very tactical and seeing that that how he started to really become like a a you know a total soldier i mean because they weren't soldiers these these were college guys. They were not, you know, they didn't go into into the military, and then they were in the military, like the Rough Riders. Like you talked to, I didn't know that about the Rough Riders with Teddy Roosevelt. I didn't know that they that were they just were adopted like in. They, yeah, these militia. militias were kind of adopted into the military. No and so watching them suddenly become military in a different way was really, really interesting And in how Levitt started you know, creating that big fly, that whole plan and then our country being a little bit on the slow side and and not providing what they needed to get it done that has got to have been so scary to be in that well, part but he was headstrong you know yeah well it's interesting what you say you know that he wasn't in the military uh, beforehand and that's true but what we didn't have time to include well there was a lot we didn't have time to include in our rather long movie but when love it was a little boy his father would quiz him as to what he had seen coming home after school every day. What did you see? How many horses were carrying that cart? Uh, what wow. direction was it headed? All of this stuff. Uh, because his father uh, ran the Union Pacific Railroad, and he was raising wow. his son, named after him, to, to take his place. And so, you know, after the war... Um, you know, he was the president of Brown Brothers Bank and also president of the Union Pacific Railroad, you know, sat on all these different boards. And mm-hmm. in 1939, he was in Milan, Italy, in a hotel, and he heard these German, uh, German officers boasting about the strength of their air force. 
and what they could do with it. And he came home, and he was taking his annual tour around the country to look at all the Union Pacific stations and rail yards and everything, just to see how everything was going. And he looked at every aerodrome and checked out all of the airplanes around the country and came back to Washington and wrote memos to Henry Stimson, the Secretary of, of War at the time, and to George Marsh, Marshall and said, you know, there's a war coming. And we are not prepared. We do not have an Air Force. And so on top of his other jobs, they made him Undersecretary of War for Air, and he started assembling an Air Force for World War II. And, you know, he, he was an amazing man. He ended up in the we, CIA. I mean, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and he wound up being, you know, Truman's um, Secretary yeah. of Defense during the Korean War. It's amazing where these gentlemen went, and it's just I'm so glad you found the story because I, I just don't think I, – I don't I, – I have no idea. And, you know, I, I have to go read the book now. Yeah. Know? Can you tell yeah. everybody the name of the book and, and the authors for everybody to know for that too? Because I want everyone to watch this, and I think we have to all read the book too if we haven't. Well, it's the same title as the film, The Millionaire's Unit, though there is a different mm -hmm. subtitle. And the author, the author is Mark Wartman, W-O-R-T-M-A-N. He lives up in New Haven, and he used to write a bit for the, the Yale Alumni Magazine. Mm -hmm. And he pulled up this story that nobody seemed to know about. Mark wow. is actually headed out to Los Angeles tomorrow. I'm going to pick him up from the airport, and we're having our Los Angeles premiere of the film at the Museum of Flying awesome. in, uh, at the Santa Monica Airport. Oh, cool. and, um, and now, I know because he's in the documentary too, and everyone, um, it goes out on VOD uh, February fifteenth, two thousand eighteen, which is tomorrow for us now. Um, this will be <laughs> tomorrow. Will be tomorrow. But um, you chose this date um, to release this. I know it's been out, um, but this is you know we can get it everywhere now, and which is great. So why is it the fifteenth that you chose? The 15th of February is a, an important date in the Yale unit's history, but it's also an important date for the nation uh, in terms of military history because uh, this was the day that Albert D. Sturdivant, who was one of the Yale unit pilots, uh, went out on a patrol and was, um, was shot down over the North mm. Sea. But the uh, personal... A connection that I, I have with that story is the fact that my grandfather, John Voorhees, and Sturdivant were stationed together over in England uh, at this point 100 years ago. And um, the weather had been bad, and Sturdivant hadn't been flying. So uh, he asked my grandfather, hey, do you think we could switch places on the next patrol? And uh, my grandfather said, well, I don't know. Let's go talk to the uh, CO about that and see what we can do. And so they did that, and this, the commanding officer said, okay, guys, you guys can switch. That's fine. And um, so Sturdivant went out on this patrol in the uh, position of second pilot, mm -hmm. and they were, uh, they were on patrol over the North Sea and were attacked by a squadron of, of German seaplanes, and Sturdivant's plane was, was shot down. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, after the, the plane was shot down, it, it crashed into the North Sea, and the pilot, the German pilots were circling, and, and they, the seas were too high, so they couldn't, couldn't land near the wreckage mm. because they saw a couple of guys on top of the wreckage clinging to it uh, in the high seas. And then they, because back in those days, they would actually reach out to their, their adversary and shake their hand after a fight sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> in this case, they were... They were Con, you know, considering rescuing these guys off the sh off the ship, and uh, they then they came back later when the weather was better to try to do it again. But the the wreckage mm. had, had you know disappeared by that point, and they couldn't find anybody. So it's uh, and again in mm. my grandfather's letters, he details the whole experience of that having happened, and um, and certainly it was a, a memory that stuck stuck with him for the rest of his life. But you know, part of our reason for releasing the film on the 15th is that, you know, we sort of dedicated mm -hmm. the whole movie to the uh, effort that these guys made, including yeah. Al and everybody else. But um, that's the significance of the date. Mm -hmm. And wasn't Al the first one that did um, lose his life out of the unit? The, 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 wasn't he the first yes, one? Yes, he was the first uh, United States naval aviator killed in combat mm -hmm. in the history mm -hmm. of the organization. Wow. Um, so 
he holds a, a place in the nation's history, and you know we dedicate the the screening to him. Well, you guys, thank you so much for making this because now I'm like I'm going to geek out. You know I'm going to now I'm going to wherever we go back east, I'm, and when we go to Florida, I'm going to Palm Beach. I'm like, okay, where were they? I, you know, it's like that. It's it's like that. It's very. It's very. You feel so connected mm-hmm. to these these men. Yeah, and I just I think that they're incredible role models, and I want for sure. So many young people to watch this, of all ages, and um, yeah, I would I like everybody in Congress to watch. Yes, it. can we send that? <laughs> can we send it to the White House and the Congress, please? <laughs> We'd like to do that for everybody to watch it. I just think it just is. It just really it it's, it's true. Very, it's it, so it's, a, it's a it's a it's a it's a film mm. of true human spirit. It really yeah. is, and and I, I, it's just it's blown us away. Um, but it's time to play happy hour because we're good at that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we want to know from each of you, if you could spend happy hour with anyone, who would it be? They could be alive or passed on, or fictional if you want. Um, and where are you going to spend happy hour? What are you going to talk about with them, and what are you going to have to drink? So let's start with you, Ron. Sure. I mean, my dream would be to hang out with my grandfather uh, mm-hmm. and his buddies um, in some airport bar like uh that overlooks the the landing strip and uh, watch the airplanes come in and maybe knock back a couple of beers and talk about what their experience was like i'd love to be able to speak to them in person mm. uh if you know if they were willing to talk about it which hopefully mm. they would be in my dream they would be um to you know find out from them what it was like to fly airplanes in 1916 and um wow and deal with the challenges that they did. Most of these guys went on to become the uh, CEOs of, of air stations, both in the United States and overseas, including my grandfather who came back and was uh, running Hampton Roads for a little while, uh, while the regular commanding officer was out. Um, he was subbing for him. But, you know, the things that he talked about when he when he was running the air station were <laughs> amazing. And I'd love to hear more about that. So um, I think that would be my dream for happy hour. I like that. And mm-hmm. can we put Orville and the, the Wright brothers in there? I'd like to see what the oh, Wright brothers. I'd love to have. Yeah, sure. Wouldn't, wouldn't it be of, cool uh, for them to be yeah. there? <laughs> I you know, there they're, was all, some... they're all up in heaven toasting you guys. I know. They're sitting on clouds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're like, thank you. Yeah. The Wright brothers would be cool mm-hmm. for them to see. That would be. And Glenn <laughs> Curtis too. He was he was a contemporary of the Wright brothers, and he designed most of the airplanes that the Yale unit guys flew. He was an amazing inventor, and um, you know, an incredible mind and very industrious gentleman. Love to mm. love to be able to chat chat up with uh, with Glenn Curtis about his early, early aviation experiences as well. I think anybody that started, I mean, now we have people oh, that, because those suits that you can fly yeah, around in. Those guys, you imagine that? the guy who, the Golfier. Yeah, Gaultier, I was thinking about Golfier, yeah. Yeah, that, that invented the hot air balloon. Because they used that at some point. Yeah. You know, that to me, people right. who had this vision of being up in the air and yeah. doing things, like that's crazy. I mean, even in the in the documentary when you talk about where they changed tactics from mm-hmm. going over the ocean all the time to actually going over land and and just going right there. I mean, that was some crazy that stuff. Was, that was I was hard. like, dude, dude, that's where that's what <laughs> reminded me of like how the the fire, like how did you get that footage? By the way, I know we're in happy hour, but how did you get that with all the explosions and here comes the planes going across? What where did that come from with the green fl- like the you know, big right. flares of green. Yes, the, the green balls were a big, uh, a big exploration for us. We really wanted to know more about them, and we did a lot of mm. research to try to find out the technical details about this particular type of munition. But they, it was some type of an exploding uh, bomb that that released some sort of green material that would try to land on the airplanes and catch their wings on fire. Oh. Um, so wow. it was, and they would shoot up in a string. So you'd see them like a string of pearls firing up into the air and, and then they would circle around. So we tried to figure out how are we going to depict that? But what we ended up doing was using some authentic fo- photographs, still photographs, and then doing some animation 
uh, over that um, and moving the camera around to create those shots. But um, yeah, that was, that was really fascinating. Yep. Mm. Wow. Okay. So Derek, let's talk about you and your happy hour choice. Would you like a green drink? (laughs) I'm sorry. Was I muted? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, Boy, that's a tough one for me. Um, It could very well be Duke Ellington or Louis Armstrong. Mm. Okay, and, you can have uh, both of them. We can have them both. We're, I we're can? Okay, both. okay. But it could also be Barbara Tuckman, who's one of my favorite historians, and Ingrid Bergman, whom I think Ooh. is not only a great actress, but a really interesting, dynamic person. Uh, and then everyone says Abraham Lincoln, um, though he wasn't much of a drinker. Uh, I'd be having a martini, and I would let Mr. Lincoln talk. Uh, I wouldn't mind meeting Ernest Hemingway. But most of all, I think it would, it would be my dad because he passed away mm-hmm. and never got to see the film. Oh, oh, yeah, that's you know you never know. Um, I do have something that is cool for you because you're a Hemingway fan. Um, oh. We have a guest coming up on the show. We haven't scheduled the actual date yet. Um, his name is Robert Wheeler. And he wrote a book called Hemingway's Havana, a reflection of the writer's life in Cuba. And it's, it's coming out March 20th. And uh, he's traveled all over the place following Hemingway's footsteps. So uh, I know. I'm just in the well, middle of booking this, and I'm like, that's wild. You guys, you guys get me obsessive about people here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I, God, so, it's just there's so much interesting stuff out there, really yeah. something. So check that book out if, if you're a Hemingway fan. So, wow. Yep. Okay. So, but you didn't say where you're going to have the, the this martini with this entire party that you're having. <laughs> oh, um, I I love France and I've been there quite a bit now. And uh, so it might be somewhere in France. But mm. I was also just in the Maldives and I'd like to see more of the Indian mm. Ocean. Mm. Um, boy, I'd have to uh, I'd have to think about that. It, it would be in France. <laughs> Uh, definitely in France. <laughs> okay. Well, we could go to the Maldives, too. I mean, yeah. why not? Yeah, you're right. Go, it's our we choice, We can do anything right? we want. It's happy hour, and that's that. That's the rule. <laughs> Thank you both for joining us. We do have a special song to play. Oh, um, I can't wait to hear what it is. We, we love to. We love to play special songs. But I want everyone to know to go to millionairesunit.org, uh, Amazon, Netflix, all those places you can get this. Go and watch it. You are going to... Get everybody that you can to watch this because it will move you and it will inspire you to learn about, you know, all these people in our, in our history, you know. Um, yeah. I love things that come out of the vaults, these kind of stories, and it's a true story, mm-hmm. and there's so many stories in there. You guys could do, like, offshoots of this, right? And I'm just kind of nudging and saying, Well, oh. actually, uh, if you get our DVD or Blu-ray, there are four supplementary films on it, and one of them is just on what it took to fly the sop with Camel. But one oh, of them is wow. a making of, and so you could sort of take a, an armchair trip with us and go to Lake Cuco, where we filmed the only flying boat in the world, and go to Europe and go to New Zealand, where we filmed with all cool. of Peter Jackson's airplanes. I want wow. to do that. Okay, so everyone, millionairesunit.org, go there. They're on Facebook as well. And, um, Ron, Derek, uh, this song is called Captain America. And yeah. I know this is a superhero. This is from Nikki Chris. She's, she's on our shows all the time. So NikkiChris.com, everyone, that's Chris, K-R-I-S, because she's, you know, related to Father Christmas. But anyway, <laughs> I know, Chris Kringle, I don't know. But anyway, okay. um, but anyway um, Nikki's awesome. She wrote this song, and um, it's really about finding your own superhero and doing the positive in life. And, you know, watching this, you know, the Millionaires Union, I think that they're superheroes. And they, sure. they put – positive stuff out there they were positive and focused and determined and courageous but so positive you know even all the letters that they wrote they were positive don't worry about me for goodness sakes don't worry about me you know and when you said that i was like wow you know so i just this i dedicate it to them and and to you both for well thank you doing this amazing, amazing documentary. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, And we've got more on the show, of course, but here's Captain America. Thank you, Ron and Derek, for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you. What a lovely show. Thanks. Thank Thank you. you. Come back anytime. I'm going to call you when we get Glenn on. We'll do World War I airfields in England. Seriously. Good. Please do. Yeah, I'm going to give him the list of names. So off we'll go. (laughs) Okay. Here it is, everyone. Captain America, find your inner superhero.
Leave the boy turn quickly into a man Wants to do what's right The best that he can't 